There's no question that aerodynamics have changed drastically since the day of the Marmon Wasp, the winner of the first Indianapolis 500 in 1911. And with the 100th edition of the race approaching, engineers at Automotive Research Center here in Indianapolis had a very clever idea. What if we took cars from different eras and put them in a virtual wind tunnel? Because even in 1911, aerodynamics were considered, as you can see by these covered wheels, tapered body, and rear section that resembled an airplane rudder. You can actually see how the air traveled over the wasp and there was a lot of disturbed air. The sharp edges on the front around the radiator caused the air to become separated and the rear suspension exposure made the wake extra dirty, actually making the tapered body design redundant. In fact, 41% of the drag on this car came from the rear suspension. Downforce was not something considered. The rear of the car produced no downforce and the front produced lift. Interestingly, the now infamous rearview mirror used by Ray Haroon actually produced an aerodynamic benefit by directing the flow around Ray's head, lowering drag, and making it more comfortable for the driver. In 1954, as evidenced by the Curtis Craft, aerodynamics was playing a larger role in the development of the cars. On this 1955 version, you can see the suspension packaging was very tidy, creating low drag in line with modern race cars. The wheels themselves were by far the biggest drag generators on the car. There was massive turbulence off the tires, large enough that they impacted the side of the body and rear wheels. While the exhaust pipes were long and exposed, those front wheel vortices covered much of the exhaust and didn't have much effect on overall drag. This was substantially more aerodynamic compared to the Marmon Wasp with 22% lower drag. The wheels and those large vortices accounted for 51% of the drag, the suspension a mere 9%, comparable to a 2011 Dallara. While the weight advantage of having the engine in the rear helped this Lotus take the pole in 1964, the 1965 race-winning Lotus 38 showed surprisingly good aerodynamics. The car design was low and sleek, smaller than any of the roadsters of that era, therefore the frontal area was smaller, producing less drag. Perhaps the most interesting feature of the car was a dual windshield. Generally, a high pressure zone builds up in front of the windshield, causing drag. By employing the dual windshield, this pressure zone was greatly reduced. The offset suspension on the Lotus helped improve mechanical grip, but also exposed a large amount of the suspension to the air. This caused higher drag on the right side, which caused the car to want to drift to the right, the opposite of what you want. The overall drag was 10% lower than the Curtis Craft, and the Lotus didn't produce any downforce. Not the case for the 2011 Dallara, where nearly 2,000 pounds of downforce was available. Design of this car was done, of course, using modern aerodynamic tools and was by far the cleanest aerodynamically. The underside of the car produced enough downforce so that the engineers were able to rely less on the rear wing. In fact, the rear wing was run at positive angles of attack at times in order to trim out as much drag as possible. The Dallara had a much larger frontal area than the Lotus, but in a fully trimmed out qualifying condition, the Dallara was very close to the Lotus. Compared to the Marmon Wasp, the Dallara had 29% less drag. The wheels are the highest generator of drag on the Dallara at 51%. This is where much of the current development continues. The 2012 Dallara lowered that number to 48%, and the current Honda and Chevrolet Aero kits further clean up the air around the wheels. So what's in store for the next 100 years? Well, that's largely in the hands of the rules makers, because aerodynamic technology already exists that can surpass the capability of the human body. So most likely, it'll continue to be a balance between speed and safety.